So I'm Anders Walgren. Um, until a couple of weeks ago, CTO at Electric Cloud. Um, Electric Cloud was acquired by CloudBees a few weeks ago, so now I am VP of Technology Strategy at CloudBees, which doesn't quite roll off the tongue like CTO does yet, but I'll, I'll get there. Um, I haven't updated the, uh, the branding on the slides yet, so I may go to marketing jail after this, uh, so come visit me. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about DevSecOps, um, sort of do a traditional kind of scare the hell out of you with, hair, with headlines and some stories about breaches, most of which you, you may have already heard about. Talk a little bit about that. And then just talk about, you know, kind of what is DevSecOps, what are some of the best practices, uh, those, those kinds of things. And then hopefully save a little bit of time for, uh, for Q&A at the end. Um, you know, one of the most overused, but also one of the most apt quotes from, from uh, Andreessen in, in uh, 2011, software is eating the world. There isn't an industry these days that is not being dominated, you know, in terms of innovation and disruption and so on by, uh, uh, by, uh, by software. Or if you're a little bit uh, more um, pessimistic, like John Willis is, I did a webinar with him just a while ago, so I stole his slide, software is infecting the world. Um, and it's, it's a little bit of a problem. Uh, it's, it's, definitely, it's definitely scary. Now, with apologies to the Beatles, I read the news today, oh boy. Um, so some headlines from somewhat recent, probably in the last, certainly in the last month, probably in the last couple of weeks. So if you're driving home, you're screwed because your car's gonna get hacked and you're, it's gonna drive you somewhere else or it's gonna stop you in the middle of the freeway or, or, or something like that. One of the interesting things about software in cars these days is there is vastly more software in an automobile today than there is in Microsoft Office, in Windows, in Linux, in dot, 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 add them all up, still less software than there is in a car. There is on the order of 90 CPUs in a modern, say, Mercedes S-Class machine, which of course has a, you know, it has a CPU to massage you, and it has a CPU to open the glove box, and, and, and so on, but there is an enormous, enormous amount of code in vehicles, right? So, you know, but that doesn't matter because you're not gonna be able to get home anyway because you're not gonna be able to fill up your tank because the gasoline uh, machines or the, the, the fill-up machines, fill-up stations have been hacked. So you're not gonna be able to get home. So don't worry about the car being hacked, right? Not a big deal. And, and so you get home somehow and you, you, know, you wanna sit down and relax and maybe play some video games. Well, no, you can't do that either, you know, because your Xbox, and I don't know if this affected Xboxes, but I'll just use that as an example, you know, it's, it's been hacked as well. And one of the interesting things about here is the idea of supply chain hacking. And I'll get into that a little bit. Um, uh, Sonatype has done some interesting uh, uh, work on, on uh, supply chain uh, aspects in, 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 in software. And in the end, you know what? It doesn't really matter anyway because you're not gonna have electricity to power your Xbox, right? Or if you kind of sat there smugly thinking, well, I drive an electric car so that gasoline thing isn't gonna, you know, that's not gonna affect me. Well, guess what? You're not gonna be able to charge your car. This, to me, is one of the scariest things because the infrastructure is incredibly unprotected. Um, in, in another life, I did some, uh, um, some consulting for a, for a large utility company uh, using, and, and they use like a lot of industrial uh, uh, type companies use, they use SCADA uh, as, as a protocol for, for controlling equipment. Completely insecure and vastly, vastly underrated in terms of how easy it is to get into those things. Most of them are still not protected. If it is security through obscurity, if you know where to go and what phone line to tap into, what modem line to tap into, you can shut things down in a, in a pretty scary way. You know, obviously the, this is being worked on. All of these things are being worked on. And, and you know, none of this is new, right? I mean, there's always, you know, for as long as there has have been software, there have been software bugs, right? And for the most part, hacking, you know, breaches, you know, those kinds of things rely on bugs. Now, is a security bug any different than a functional bug? I don't think so. They're, they're both aspects of quality, right? Now, you might say that, uh, you know, well, well uh, you know, security bug, it, it, you know, it's more serious than a regular bug because it exposes my credit card information. Well, I, I don't know if I agree with that completely because what if it's a bug in the, you know, MRI machine? and all of a sudden you get nuked with the wrong kind of radiation, which that wouldn't necessarily happen in an MRI, but, but if you're in a, some sort of radiation treatment, and this has happened, where there are software errors, and you get you know, 10, 20, 100 times the dose that you're supposed to get, you die. So you can't really convince me that security bugs are any more serious than any other kinds of bugs. Bugs are bugs. 
So this really is a quality problem, is what it comes down to. Now, if only there was a way to track vulnerabilities, you say, right? So obviously NIST has a way uh, to, to track vulnerabilities. They've, they've got a database, and there's tons of other ones out there as well. This particular vulnerability, CVE 2017-5638, which it sounds like it should be in the movie Brazil, you know, you gotta fill in that form before we come and fix your air conditioning. Um, this, is, this became known as the Equifax breach. Uh, it was discovered on the 6th of March, 2017, uh, publicly announced three days later, and the CVE was entered into the database uh, on the 10th. And, and this, this is a bug in, in the Apache struts library uh, that basically allows you to execute arbitrary commands on the system that's running struts. So very, very serious problem, especially for something that would be publicly facing, where you don't even have to kind of breach into the data center before you can take advantage of it. So, so we track it, right, which is wonderful. That's good, that's, that's not a bad thing, but it's not nearly enough. So here's kind of a tale of two responses uh, to this particular uh, vulnerability, and I, I owe a lot of this information uh, from John Willis, who gives an excellent presentation of this, and I, I, I freely admit that I steal from great people who do great presentations, uh, hopefully with attribution. So two companies. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna reveal which one is which in the end, but you probably can already sort of guess. So company A discovered the problem the day that it was announced. So if we go back here and say the public announcement was on 3.9, company A discovered it on 3.9. I think 3.9 was a Thursday. On the Friday, they already took action. And basically what they decided to do was over the weekend, they shut down all access to their applications, right? Which is a pretty serious thing to do. But the problem they had, the problem that they faced was, okay, fine, so we have a vulnerability in struts. There are a million different versions of struts. Maybe not a million, but certainly hundreds, right? And, and there's some famous stories about companies who have tried to figure out how many different versions of struts they run inside the enterprise. And the answer for a lot of them is pretty much every single version, right? And we'll get to a little bit of the detail around that later. But so what they did was they, they, you know, they basically, you know, CISO said, this is very serious. We have to figure out, first of all, where are we running this? And we have to do some penetration testing ourselves to figure out what's going on. But the net net is, by the time Tuesday rolled around, they had remediated this problem. They had patched and, and gotten past the vulnerable version of struts. You know, it's hard to argue that you could go a whole lot faster than that, right? Less than a week for, for, a, major, you know, for a major operation. Um, now contrast that with company B, um, you know, they didn't even discover the existence of this vulnerability until four months after it was announced, right? So four months elapsed where it's in the vulnerability database. They have this version of struts deployed, but apparently just the, whether it was somebody missed it or, or it wasn't somebody's job to check these things, or I don't know exactly what, 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 what the problem was, although of course, well, I'll give some more kind of color and detail on this in a second. But then it was another basically two months before they remediated, right? So there, were, there, there was a period of about six months, you know, give or take, you know, plus or minus, because I'm not exactly sure on, you know, discovered here, announced here, not exactly sure when the remediation happened. So, so let's give them the benefit of the doubt that they, that they, you know, remediated it the second they discovered it, which they did not do and say, well, that's still four months of, of vulnerability, right? Plus, however time, however long time the vulnerability was in the code before it was actually discovered, which I don't recall off the top of my head, but it probably wasn't zero days, right? It was probably there for a while. So the net net is several months, right? Several months, and, and you know, probably no surprise as to who the companies were. This one was Fannie Mae. They did an awesome job, I have to say, I mean, kudos. And, and John Willis tells a good story because he, he knows a couple of the people there. Just about, I mean, basically one of the security people kind of went out on a ledge and went to her boss, I think in, in, in this case, and said, look, I, we don't know exactly what versions we're running everywhere. I think the only safe thing we can do is shut the whole damn thing down, or at least turn off access to the outside world, right? Pull, pull the plug on the internet, if you will. And then have an intensive period of time, over the weekend no less, to figure out where we're vulnerable, patch them, and then bring back the system up, which they were able to do. Contrast that with company B, which is Equifax, right? No, no, no big surprise there. I read the GAO report, the Congressional 
a report on this, which it's a little bit dry and there aren't a ton of details in there, but there are some nuggets in there. Um, the chief information security officer at Equifax, who didn't have the, that title at the time, it was a slightly different title, was not informed of this discovery until 30 days afterwards. So the head of security for Equifax was not informed that this breach was in place and, and in fact was being exploited at the time, right? And one of the reasons for that was the, the security officer did not report up to the CIO. And the person that, that was kind of in charge of this effort, I'm paraphrasing here, go read the report, you know, if you want the details, but reported to the CIO. And so the, 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 the security officer reporting chain was different and they basically asked him, didn't you think you ought to tell the CISO that this was happening? And the answer was basically, well, no, different chain of reporting, right? So to me, that sort of says kind of cultural problem, maybe, or organizational structural problems, you know, those kinds of things. And, and, and you know, then just the fact that, you know, it took them so long to even discover the fact that they were vulnerable to this, I think is, a, is for, for a company like Equifax, who, if you think about it and what they do in terms of credit ratings and, and those kinds of things, have a really huge impact on our lives, right? I mean, if, if, if your data gets hacked in Equifax and all of a sudden your credit rating drops into the, into the basement, you don't get a mortgage, you don't get a car loan, you don't get a credit card, you don't, you know, any of these things, right? So this, this has big impact on, on, on people's lives. And, and, you know, never mind that, you know, when I, I believe it was the CEO and when he was, uh, you know, testifying in front of Congress, basically threw the poor individual engineer whose job it was to do these patches under the bus, right? Which to me is the biggest indicator of what a, and pardon my French, what a fucked up culture they must have had or must have at, at Equifax. That the CEO, who of course later was let go, I think, um, would, would, you know, and kind of stoop down to sort of blaming an individual for that when this was clearly a systemic, procedural, process, cultural, you know, there's probably a few more, I don't have any fingers left on that, on that hand, you know, kind, kind of problem. But that's why this is kind of a tale of two responses, right? What, what, what do you do in order to, to respond to these things and, and how do you work? So, of course, the, the vulnerability was patched, but, and here we kind of get to the supply chain problem a little bit. Um, as of the fall of, and this comes from Sonatype's uh, software supply chain report, Sonatype, in case you don't know, are the people that run the Maven repositories. They run NPM repositories and they run a bunch of repositories. So they see all the downloads that we're doing as we're typing, you know, Maven install or, you know, Gradle build or, you know, uh, whatever, whatever other ways that we, that we build these things. So as of the fall of that year, over 3,000 organizations downloaded the exact version of Struts 2 that was publicly disclosed as vulnerable on 310 and then subsequently you know, exploited between, between May and, and September of, uh, of 17. A bunch more organizations downloaded a version of Struts with known vulnerabilities despite perfectly safe versions being available. In other words, they're pulling down old versions, right? So people are not paying attention to the fact or are not you know, putting resources on paying attention to the fact that, hey, you kind of got to keep your, your third party dependencies up to date uh, with, with some regularity so that you pick up fixes for vulnerabilities or, or, or you're kind of kind of screwed. So, you know, th this is a little bit of a supply chain issue. And, you know, I think you can certainly have a discussion about, you know, hey, Sonatype, should you maybe take down the vulnerable, you know, artifacts? And, and actually, I, I had a little bit of this discussion with Derek Weeks, who's one of the guys that works at Sonatype. And he has a good point, which is, look, we're a repository, right? And, and, and we're here as kind of a, a neutral vendor in the sense of, you know, publish your stuff, we'll, you know, we'll serve it for you. Um, we certainly, you know, we'll, we'll do, you know, they, they, start, they are starting to do things like vulnerability disclosures and so on, but I think, you know, GitHub does some interesting things if you, if you use GitHub and if you have, you know, say a Maven Palm-based project, you can actually turn on vulnerability scanning for your third-party dependencies in your Maven Palms. I recommend you do that because it's pretty useful um, because that will, you know, ping you, send you an email, give you an alert on the web page, all of those kinds of things of, hey, look, this project has these two dependencies that have these known vulnerabilities. If you upgrade to this version, you can work around that. So it's you know, just another thing that kind of puts that information in front of you and makes it easier uh, for you to know that you, uh, that you need to act. Uh, most of us, unfortunately, don't. Um, a different vulnerability, not the, not the struts one, because I don't want to pick on struts too much, but this one I think was in Spring Boot. Um, but kind of just similar kind of uh, uh, data here in terms of 
you know, before the disclosure, um, developers downloaded this component, you know, 400 and something thousand times. While, you know, they believed it was good, right? This was pre-disclosure of the vulnerability. Um, in the five months after the disclosures, they were being downloaded 367,000 times. So basically only an 11% dip. So post-disclosure, people are still pulling down vulnerable code, right? That is a problem, or that is an indicator of a problem, right? Because that, that means there's stuff out there that, that's definitely still vulnerable. You know, somewhere on the order of you know, this number of things that are vulnerable, you, know, you probably have to divide for the number of developers and all that sort of stuff, so it probably isn't you know, quite that many. But it's a, but it's a, you know, it's a serious problem. It's, 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 it's definitely an issue. Uh, that, that, that you need to worry about. Now this graphic here comes from Sonotype's uh, state of the software supply chain. And there's some interesting things in here and I have, I have an updated version of this slide too after I talk about uh, some, other, some other things. You know, here's an interesting one. I, I don't know if you guys know what the Bouncy Castle library is, but it's a crypto library uh, that a lot of people use. It used to be much more, uh, I, I would say much more frequently used before export restrictions on crypto were relaxed a little bit because uh, they had implementations of algorithms that were otherwise, uh, you know, sort of not not available in the JDK, for example. Um, so 5.8 million vulnerable Bouncy Castle libraries downloaded last year. So that's kind of in line with, with the numbers for that Spring Boot library and, and for struts in terms of vulnerable, known vulnerable uh, versions of things being downloaded. One out of 16 downloads included at least one known security vulnerability. Right? I mean, so you can see how this is a, you know, this, 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 is, this is kind of reflected as a, you know, a supply chain problem, which it really is, right? I mean, this is, if you go to Safeway, you know, or whatever grocery store you go to, and you go to the meat section, and you've got the meat that has E. coli and the meat that doesn't have E. coli, everybody's just kind of grabbing whatever it is they feel like grabbing, right? And, and, and you know, the, 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 the food supply chain is monitored a little bit better, I would say, than the software supply chain at, at this point, right? We really don't have a process for, you know, as I was kind of talking about before, you know, how do we get the vulnerable artifacts out of there, right? Now that's complicated, because if Sonatype all of a sudden were to say, okay, we're gonna delete any artifact with a, with a known vulnerability, well, you, that's not practical, right? From the point of view of, you know, now how do I fix things? You know, how do I test with the old version to, to verify that the problem is there, and then when I upgrade, how do I test with the new version to make sure that it's fixed, and all of those things. So it's, you know, in my conversation with Derek, he had some really good points for like, like it really isn't, it probably isn't even a good idea to, to, to get rid of all the, uh, the vulnerable versions, but something has to happen, you know, some, some sort of, you know, uh, hey, did you really mean to download this? You know, now of course all of this stuff happens you know, in scripts and in Maven and Gradle and these things. So there's really no user interaction uh, most, of, uh, most of the time. Um, you know, the number of vulnerable components uh, that get pulled in all the time is, 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 is pretty high. And, and I mean, and this kind of stands to reason, right? Older components and applications have 3x higher rate of vulnerabilities, you know, because they haven't been fixed yet because they're in old components. Um, but this is, you know, a little bit, a little bit scary, right? I mean, this, this definitely gives you pause. So DevSecOps. Um, I, I think the biggest thing that DevSecOps helps with is just make security the path of least resistance, right? Don't force people to jump through hoops and, and all of these things. Make all of these things happen as part of your daily pipeline and release pipeline kind of activities, right? We just heard if you were in the room previously about, you know, sort of microservices and pipelines and scanning and logging and all of those things. This is hygiene at this point, folks. It's hygiene, right, to, to do these kinds of things. So, you know, so if we take our, you know, kind of very, very simple kind of, uh, you know, uh, example of a software supply chain, right? We've got our delivery team, they're building a bunch of code, gets checked into GitHub, we build it in Jenkins, we do some testing, maybe with Selenium, we use Ansible to, you know, uh, push up and, and, and push things into stage and prod, and we've got a pipeline orchestration tool and all of those things, right? Fantastic. What we need to do is we need to incorporate security scans into that, if nothing else, right? Whatever you're doing, you know, if you're, if you're using Docker containers, maybe Twistlock to, to scan your containers, or, you know, there's a bazillion tools out there, right, to, to, do, these, uh, to do these kinds of things. Um, the, the, think about, think about third-party dependency management as, think about it like your food or water supply chain, right? You want to make sure that you're not buying the, the, the pound of meat that has the E. coli. You want to buy the pound of meat 
would, would, not, would not be E. coli, right? Or you don't want the water that's coming from, you know, the old lead pipes. You know, you want the water that's coming from the, I was going to say the new lead pipes, but <laughs> from, from not the lead pipes, whatever they happen to be. Um, and, and the idea here is very much, look, if, 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 you, if you have a pipeline uh, system uh, that, that you use, that, that you use for automation of, you know, your kind of build, test, qualify, release uh, type activities, then you can make these things part of every single cycle, right? Assuming that, that you know, now some of these things, you know, obviously a static code analysis is probably going to take a lot longer to run than, say, a twist lock scan, which is just going to look and see what artifacts you have. In, in your container. So, so you kind of have to decide, you know, do, do, if, if we have an hour long scan that we want to run, do we do it on every CI run, right? Or do we do that as a follow up in the pipeline later on, right? So once we've maybe, you know, gotten a little bit further down, you know, we don't, we don't want engineers necessarily to, to have to wait an hour to find out that they you know, broke the compile, right? On the other hand, we don't want the engineer to have to wait a week to find out that hey, you just updated a dependency and it now has a vulnerability in it, right? So you, you, you have to find a balance there because you don't want your CI cycle to be six hours, um, but you also don't want it to be so short and do so little that it takes you a week or a month before you get feedback that you actually you know, kind of pulled something in that, that, that broke it. So what are the kinds of things, what are the kinds of activities that, that you want to do around this? So you know, security training, you know, security requirements, threat modeling, architecture reviews, you know, paying attention to things like the OWASP top 10. I forget what OWASP stands for, but basically it's, hey, here's a bunch of vulnerabilities that you ought to worry about because they're really bad. Um, and, and the interesting thing about these things is, you know, we, we, very, we worry so much about external threats and bad actors and, you know, Russians and Iranians and, you know, Danish people and maybe less about the Danish people, but they're very nice. I'm Swedish, so I can say that. Um, but really, the problem is internal, right? The problem is our supply chain, that we're, that we're still pulling in and using stuff that's broken, that's vulnerable. We Stop doing that, you know? Um, that, that's really what it comes, in, com, comes down to. And then as you get a little bit further down in the pipeline, I mean, you, you, might, you may even have the notion of, hey, look, we failed to build if you're using a, if you're using a, a, a known vulnerable third-party dependency. It doesn't even get that far. Static code analysis, security policies, you know, all of these things. I'm not going to read all of these things to you because they also duplicate a little bit once you get out to the right, the right side here. But, you know, automated penetration testing, you know, more analysis and config analysis. And, and you need to do monitoring post-production as well, right? Because you may have shipped a library that has a vulnerability but which was not known until after you're in production. So this, this work doesn't stop. You know, when you do, you know, it doesn't become Ops's problem, you know, like, okay, throw it over the fence, now you guys worry about it, right? You have to continue to monitor and really kind of have a, a, an idea of what your inventory is, what your bill of materials is that you have in production. Because these vulnerabilities may well get disclosed a long time after you push things into, into production. So you need to be able to, to, to uh, respond to that. Uh, and, and these are, you know, obviously this is a long list of things to do. Not everybody maybe needs to do all of them, but you got to at least do, do some of them. A great book, the DevOps Handbook, uh, that, I'll, that I'll plug a little bit. Uh, Gene Kim, Jez Humble, Patrick Dubois, the coiner of the phrase DevOps, uh, and John Willis uh, wrote this. And, and there's a lot of best practices here, right? I mean, you want to train development teams to develop secure code. Now, bugs will happen, right? No question. <laughs> But, but there are definitely things that you can do to train people to be more aware of, of what to do things. And of course, the types of problems that you're looking for are gonna differ based on the types of, a, of tool chain that you're using. You know, we, we don't necessarily worry too much about buffer overruns in Java, but we certainly do in C and C++ and you know, other sort of native kind of closer to the metal type languages. Track security issues, the same as software issues, right? And, and again, there's kind of two parts to this for me, right? One is bugs are bugs. Security bug, functional bug, performance bug, bugs are bugs. You know, treat them, you know. Now, a security issue may be more serious and may require you to react more quickly, right, than, than maybe a functional bug does, although not necessarily, because if you're losing a ton of money on the functional bug, you may want to treat that with a lot of uh, alacrity as, 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 as well. Um, and, but, but again, also this, this notion that, you know, track security issues, right? Know what's out there. Know, know what vulnerabilities uh, you're, you're going to be exposed to. 
And if you're doing infrastructure through code, then security should also be code, right? So your firewall policies, um, you know, network mappings, you know, all of the things, you know, if you're using Kubernetes and all of these things, uh, everything is code and or declarative is, is definitely a way to go. Integrate security controls into the software pipeline, right? So kind of going back to the, to the, 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 the slide before, you know, make these scans not as something that we do the day before we release, right? That is the, you know, I mean, don't not do it the day before the release as well, but that better not be the first time that you do a security scan, right? Because now it, that's the worst time to find out because now you have to scramble to fix it or delay your release or, or, or. And it may well be that, you know, to upgrade that third party dependency, yeah, maybe all you have to do is go in and poke in a different version in your palm file, but what if there's an API change associated with it? Now you have code. Now you're gonna have to roll back your pipeline and, and re-execute it. Um, and, and, and that can take time. So, so make this just a daily part of, you know, regular part of the hygiene of the pipeline, basically. And, and kind of similarly here, automate security testing, right? If you can do simple penetration testing as, as, as part of your software pipeline, do so. And automate it, right? Automate, 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 automate. Do not do these things manually. Uh, if you do them manually, they will take longer. Um, they will get done less often. They will be skipped when people are under pressure. Uh, all of those kinds of things. Detect known vulnerabilities during the pipeline. So this could be if you use GitHub, turn on their vulnerability detection for third-party dependencies. Run your scanning tools, run your static analysis, all of those things. And then of course, monitor in production, right? Because things can get discovered after you go to production. So that's very important as well. And then, you know, a little bit of chaos monkey isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? In, in, inject failures, you know, what if, what if, what if I send a huge amount of data to this endpoint and it chokes, you know, what happens, right? So do some, you know, kind of penetration testing of, of, of your own. So here's a more, uh, uh, an up-to-date, uh, this is I think from 2018 from, from Sonatype, also the, the, the state of supply chain uh, in software, uh, focusing a little bit more on OSS breaches, but that's kind of relevant to the example I gave. So here's a scary thing. The number of days between vulnerability disclosure and exploit <laughs> has gone down from 45 days to three days, right? So conceivably, you know, if Equifax had been a little bit faster, they could have snuck in under the wire, right? Let's say that, they, let's say that it took them two months, right? We'll, we'll, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. So, you know, they, they could have been there. But nowadays, Fannie Mae barely would have made it, right? I mean, or, or in fact, kind of wouldn't, you know? And the only reason they did was they they, they shut down access to their systems, right? Which was a responsible, but a big thing to do, right? Uh, now it was over the weekend and that may have helped them a little bit, although some people question that because it's Fannie Mae, so it's a lot of consumer stuff. And when are people you know, doing stuff on the Fannie Mae website? You know, probably not at work all day long. It's probably over the weekend when they're trying to figure out can they afford a new house, all that sort of stuff. Eight struts breaches uh, made headlines over the past year. Not to pick on struts, but th that, that name has come up you know, quite a bit. Now here are some interesting things. So use of automation, 50% reduction in use of vulnerable OSS components when applying automation, right? So if you're doing these security scans as part of your pipelines, you will at least know that you have vulnerabilities in there. Now you also have to act on that and, and update the, the dependencies, right? And more, you know, kind of more, more uh, on topic with the talk here, 57% uh, of DevOps teams automate security across the software development lifecycle. Certainly room for improvement there, but that's, you know, it's not a bad, that's not a bad percentage. Um, and DevOps teams are 90% more compliant when OSS security policies are automated. You know, automate, 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 right? That, that really is the key. Whenever you rely on people to remember things, to remember to do things, you know, uh, there's one, th if there's one thing computers are good at, it's remembering to do things and doing them over and over and over again, right? They, they pretty much excel at that. Humans, not so much. Um, one in eight OSS component downloads contain a known security vulnerability, right? So we're still kind of in that world uh, a little bit, which is, uh, which is a tad frightening, uh, of course. Now, um, so not just to scare you, <laughs> but, but this, is, this is fact, right? The, the, this, this is the state of the world right now is, you know, we're, we're all, if we're, especially if we're in a large organization with multiple teams, multiple products, multiple services, we're slurping these third-party dependencies at a furious rate. Now, 
some organizations, you know, more, more I would say kind of in fintech and maybe aerospace, but, but not universally in, in, in those arenas, they, they, they just shut off access to the public repositories, right? And they run their own internal repositories that are very carefully populated. And, and they will do things like, oh, there's a vulnerability in that version of struts, whoosh, gone, right? And the next time a team tries to build and, and tries to access that version, uh -uh -uh. Um, a little bit draconian, but you gotta do something, right? You know, you gotta, you gotta wake people up to this. So back to our kind of, you know, DevSecOpsy kind of supply chain. Um, and going into a little bit more detail on things that you can do in your pipeline to help with this. So model and automate everything. I'm gonna do a slide on each of these here. Uh, hopefully I think I have time to do that. Yeah. Um, monitor and track your releases. Provide environments and automation as a service. This is especially important if you're a large organization with 50, 100, 500, 5,000, 10,000 applications or components and services. Um, build in security and compliance to the greatest extent possible, right? Um, and then adopt new technologies safely. Um, that, that's another thing that's fairly important. So model and automate everything, right? So model your applications in your pipeline environments, right? What are the artifacts? How do they fit together? all of those kinds of things. Um, once you model these things, they're also kind of repeatable, they're auditable and manageable. In a lot of cases, you can do it as code. You, know, you can use <laughs> domain-specific languages to do this in, in, in a bunch of the products that, that are out there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm showing our product here, but, but that's not by any means the only place where you can do that kind of stuff. Uh, so I, I'm trying not to shield too much for, for our stuff. But uh, you know, eliminate drift and unplanned work and sort of the heroic efforts by just employing standardized efforts every time, right? You shouldn't have to have the you know, day of release or night of release, oh my God, we have a vulnerability, we need to update it, you gotta come back into the office and you know, work all night to do that, right? That, you know, that burns people out. Um, and and you know, maybe you have you know, full, full stack developers, um, and I, I, I hate to say this, There's no, there is no such thing as a full stack developer. And if there is, they're burned out within six months. What you gotta worry about instead is full stack teams, right? If you try to hire the unicorns, the, the full stack developers, you know, th that is a dangerous road to go down because that is, you're turning them into a hero, right? Heroes burn out um, and that's not a good way to run an organization. Focus instead on full stack teams. Make sure you have all of the pieces together and accessible on the same team. Not, not on another team, not in a different silo that I now have to come find and communicate with and, and all of those kinds of things, but on the team, right? We're, we're in general, just a sidebar here a little bit, you know, in general, we're moving away from kind of siloed project oriented teams, right? Where we have here are the DBA people, here are the security people, here are the, the firewall people, and you know, it, it's, you know, it's like you're at the DMV, you kind of go from window to window to window to get your, you know, your thing stamped, and at the end, you're secure. Not, right? A much better way to do it is to structure teams around product, right? And make sure that those product teams are full stack teams. You know, the idea of the full stack developer is, is really a myth at this point, I think. Um, separation of duties, you still need to, to, to hew to, right? Especially if you're in a regulated industry, that still makes sense. Monitor and track releases, right? So you, you wanna be able to sort of look at dashboards, look at all the metrics, um, you know, start, th this really has a lot to do with kind of collaboration and alignments, because everybody sees the same thing. What is our code coverage, right? What is our pass rate failure? Um, what is our pass failure rate? What, what is our, you know, deployment success rates? All of these kinds of things. And, and a very simple thing, which really isn't necessarily security related, but when you start to automate all of these things and monitor and track them, you start to see bottlenecks a lot more easily, right? You know, those tall blades of grass tend to stick up a little bit more. And then you know that that's probably where you gotta put some resources, right? Whether that's a manual step that takes an extraordinarily long amount of time and that time could be better spent you know, shipping earlier or shipping with more quality or shipping with a bunch more functionality or, you know, use, use that time however you want, but don't waste it, right? So build, you know, dashboards around, you know, what, what you're doing and, you know, track all of these things. They, they, you know, it's all, it's all goodness. Um, next topic, you know, provide environments and automation as a service. This is really important. Um, and I have an example from an old customer of ours in the pharmaceutical arena. And back in the days when they did hardware, just hardware, um, their service level agreement for provisioning a new system was six weeks, right? From the time that you requested the hardware to when it was rack stacked, powered, cooled, OS installed, and now you could, you know, kind of start using it. 
They virtualized completely. You know, this was a while ago, obviously. Um, and at the end of their, their conversion to, to using virtual machines instead of just hardware, their new SLA for provisioning a new system, uh, virtual system, was six weeks. So they didn't change their SLA at all, even though they went from, you know, I got to spend time to rack and stack and all these things to where I just have to type a command and five minutes later I have the system that you need, right? So they kind of missed an opportunity there and they realized that, which is why they, they started working on that. One of the ways that they fixed that was by, by providing self-service access to these kinds of things, right? And, and one of the ways that I think of self-service inside of an enterprise is, it's like the menu at a restaurant, right? If you want a particular system stood up, right? I need this kind of system because I'm gonna install this application on it so that I can do this testing, right? Oftentimes today that's, you know, submit a service ticket, right? Which is really just a glorified post-it note because it doesn't actually do anything. It waits until, you know, Bob gets back from lunch and sees the ticket, acts on it, and then maybe, you know, proactively sends you an email or something and you get notified that it's there. But if you do things through the, the self-service approach, and oh, by the way, before Bob did that, he wanted to make sure that you had architecture committee approval and security committee approval and network committee approval and, and all of those kinds of things, right? Because every single new de deployment was new to him, right? If you, if you go down kind of the self-service catalog route, then what this becomes is, here are the ways that the company, our company, does a JBoss deployment, does an AWS deployment, does a Kubernetes deployment, you know, all of those kinds of things. And, and because, and kind of going back to my, my, uh, my analogy of the menu, because you're ordering off the menu, you get your food fast, right? So you get, you get your system set up in 15 minutes because you're ordering something that's pre-approved, right? We know how to build it, we know it's secure, we know where it's gonna run, we know how it's gonna run, all of those kinds of things. If you need something that's, you know, if you want the chef to make you something special, then you gotta go through the exception process, right? Now you gotta sit through the architecture committee, the security committee, the committee of committees, you know, all of, all of those kinds of things. And then maybe at the end of that process, they say, no, this isn't really a new thing, you really ought to be using this. We already have it. And, and you, you think that you don't wanna use that, but you do. Or the idea is, hey, look, we got a new menu item. We found a new thing that we need and now it's there and the next person doesn't have to wait six weeks to get it, they get it in 15 minutes, right? Not having to wait and I'm using the six weeks example because it's true. Not having to wait six weeks for something to get stood up, that's a lot of time. That's a lot of time that you're not testing your product if that's what you wanted the system stood up for. So that sort of flexibility is easy and it also gives you a good leg up on governance, right? Because now you know that your systems are being set up in a way that's you know, firm approved, as they would say, you know, as a lot of the financial, uh, apparently in the financial community, you don't call yourself a company, you're a firm. Uh, so I've, I've learned to adopt that, uh, that terminology. Um, and then, you know, all the goodness around, you know, calendaring and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And then, you know, kind of build in the security and compliance, right? So make sure that your, um, that your pipelines are doing the right kinds of scans, that you're not going to be able to go into production without doing all of those things. And really, a part of this is kind of shift left, right? Push, push as much of this as possible to the left because you need to discover it early in the process, right? When discovering a security vulnerability the day that you're gonna release, that's really an awkward, uncomfortable moment. You, you really don't wanna be in that place. You know, much less discovering it after you've gone into production, right? That's truly awkward. Um, but, you know, the interesting thing is in terms of compliance, you know, auditors, and here I'm gonna greatly simplify things and probably, you know, uh, upset auditors if there are any in the room, but auditors really want two things. They want you to document what you do and they want you to prove that you did what you documented, right? Automation, a full stack automation end to end of a software pipeline, sort of an executable value stream, if you will, is the documentation of how you, well, of your path to production for your software. And once you execute that, you now have the proof that you did what you documented. So automation really is, is, is your friend here. And then I'll just kind of stop on this here in terms of, you know, if you need to adopt new technologies, you know, these kinds of systems, whether are, you know, whether it's Jenkins or Electric Flow or, you know, any of the other ones that are out there, the plugins that are in there give you easy access to doing the simple things that you need to do with these APIs. Not necessarily, you know, if, if you look at the WebSphere APIs, for example, there's probably, I don't know, 1,200 calls in the WebSphere API. Why learn that when all you really need are 12? Right, and, and, and the 12 are gonna ask you the questions in, in, in a much better way. So I'd, I'd, I'd sort of say that that's, that's a good way to, to go about it as well. Shameless plug for the DevOps Enterprise Summit in London coming up in June. 
Uh, if you haven't been to a DevOps Enterprise Summit, there's also one in uh, uh, Vegas, which is sort of the main one in October, I believe, late October. Um, these are awesome. Um, it's, it's experience reports, it's repeat experience reports, you know, subject matter experts, you know, next gen everything. It's, people really kind of, um, I don't know if this is a, this may, be, this may be an anachronistic sort of a, a term, but people really open the kimono a little bit at these conferences and talk about, here's an outage we had, here's how we diagnosed the problem, here's the cultural issues that we discovered as part of this, and here's what people were yelling at each other about and where the finger pointing happened and, and how we work to resolve that issue and, and kind of set the team up for better success uh, in, the, in, the, in the future. Uh, thank you very much, everyone.